it's like to design a TypeScript uh, system for, for JavaScript. Um, and type, TypeScript has a very different type system than, than anything I've worked on, which is what makes it fun as a, as a language designer. Um, it is gradually typed, which is in a sense a new uh, discipline. It is structurally typed. It is also generic. Um, it relies extensively on type inference. It uses control flow based type analysis. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of novel type constructors and distinct namespaces for types and values so we can sneak all the types into JavaScript code without getting name conflicts. And so there's a bunch of things in there that are, that are sort of uh, solved in, in new and, and, and interesting ways. And, and in particular, uh, the, the, the one at the bottom there, TypeScript is both object oriented and also a deeply functional programming language. You can, you can use you know, all, the, all the mainstream functional programming techniques uh, you know, and, 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 and like some of our support for discriminated unions and, and uh, union types and so forth is, is, is quite advanced. Um, now, the, the gradual type system thing I think is, is perhaps particularly interesting. You know, it, it was always the case, or at least it used to be, yeah, with, 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 with TypeScript uh, system research that, that, that it was all predicated on soundness. This notion that your type checker will prove, will not allow something that, that is as undefined behavior to get through the checker, right? Um, like you can't assign a pointer to an integer and, and you know, or because, I mean, that could be, or an integer to a pointer because then you could access uninitialized memory and that would be bad, right? And so because type system research was sort of, in that sense, constrained, there was a lot of research that didn't actually happen that even so was interesting. And in particular, there was very little that happened in this space of gradual typing because TypeScript, is, our type system is in a sense a Swiss cheese. It's full of holes. I mean, it's, yes, but that's by design. You don't have to type everything, but the more stuff you give types to, the more we can help. And there are certain modes you can be in where nothing can be of type any, and then we can actually start to provide some guarantees, but it is not a requirement. And that means that there's a much lower threshold barrier to entry, right? Um, and it also means that we can explore avenues of type system capabilities that no one has ever looked at because they just sort of deemed them unsound uh, to begin with. But the interesting thing about where we work is that underneath it all, there's JavaScript. And JavaScript has meaningful semantics defined for anything you can do. It's, you're never gonna observe uninitialized memory or whatever. Now, the meaningful semantics might not be useful semantics, but they're, but they're well-defined, uh, which means your programs are never gonna behave in an unpredictable manner, no matter what you do, right? And because that is the case, it's actually fine to have a type system that doesn't prove everything to be sound, right? And once you do that, then all of a sudden you can explore all sorts of new areas that no one has ever gone to before, and that's actually what makes this really interesting, right? And really useful, it turns out. Uh, now, I mentioned also here that, that uh, the type system is structural uh, as opposed to nominal type systems like say C-sharp or Java where, where you know, when in, in those nominal type systems, when you have a, a base class and a derived class, you know, you can, you can only assign a derived to a base if it explicitly says that it extends that derived, uh, that base class. And likewise, you can, only, you can only be treated as an interface if you explicitly say that you implement that interface. In contrast, there are structural type systems where as long as you fulfill the contract by structure, as long as if, if an interface says you must have three methods foo, or two methods foo and bar, and you have two methods foo and bar, well then you implement the interface without saying anything further. Um, and that's actually a much, much gentler world for someone as a programmer to live in because you, know, you don't have to first overly specify the problem, you just go along with sort of this duck typing, if, if, if you will. But as a type system implementer, it also causes you to run into a whole bunch of headaches. Um, here, for example, is, is, is one really gnarly problem. Like, let's say you have two types, foo and, and bar, that are structurally identical, but are, but are defined differently, right, or separately. And now let's say that you assign a bar of string to a foo of string. How does the type checker know that that is okay? Well, in a structural type system, the way you do it is you say, okay, well, let's see, foo of string requires you to have an item property. Does bar of string have an item property? Yes, does it have the same type? Yes, there's string, that's good. Now let's look at the next property. Well, that's of type foo of foo of string. Well, now we gotta go make type foo of foo of string. And now we have bar of bar of string. And then, well, do they compare? Well, yes, they have an item property. And then we get to the next property. Well, now we make a foo of foo of foo of string and a bar of bar of bar of string. And, and off we go to, to, to the races and it's, you know, it's turtles all, all the way down. And you end up in these deeply, recursive like crazy problems that you're, you're staring at and, and you know, as we went about implementing this, it, it's, it's funny, we actually like, we ran into problems that apparently have no solution in, 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 in known type systems. We talked to some of the, Microsoft research has some of the preeminent researchers in type systems and we talked to some of them and they were like, no, no, we don't actually know a solution to that problem. Um, it turns out that in order to do this stuff, you sort of have to cheat and you, you so, so we have this thing we call the turtle cutoff where, you know, if we see <laughs> five levels of recursion that are manufacturing the same types, then we just stop and then we say, let's assume that that's true. Now, if everything else is also true, then we're just gonna say it's true. Uh, because we don't have to be sound. We don't actually have to prove that this is true. It is just beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Um, it turns out this works marvelously. No, it, it took the user community like six years before someone even reported a bug that was related to this. They had some crazy JSON, very deep JSON thing that they were in, inferring a type for and then discovered that at seven levels, all of a sudden, something wasn't being checked in here because, well, the turtle cut off. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, those are sort of some of the, the, the crazy things that, that, uh, that you end up looking at. In fact, someone actually put up a, uh, a, a GitHub issue uh, <laughs> proving that TypeScript has a Turing complete type system. He, and he has, if, if you want to really geek out on types, go look at this, this issue here. It, it, he's actually creating types that can add and subtract and multiply numbers at compile time in the type system. You know, uh, so, so that's how expressive it, it, it has gotten. Um, okay, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, some of the things that, 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 that make the the types themselves novel and interesting, um, the, the, the novel type constructors here. Um, you're all familiar, of, of course, sort of with one of the basic type constructors we have, which is object types, you know, x colon t and y colon u up there. But over time, we have added more and more of these type constructors. We've added union types, intersection types, uh, index, index access, and so forth. And I'll give you some examples of what these are and how it is that this makes it a, a very different uh, uh, type system. So at the very bottom of JavaScript and TypeScript, we have values, and that's sort of where where J JavaScript's runtime dynamic type system and TypeScript's static type system meet. They meet sort of at the bottom where there are values. JavaScript programs are all about producing values and writing logic that can make new values out of existing values, right? Like, and there are groups of values in there, um, like strings and numbers and uh, trues and falses and, and whatever. Now, in TypeScript, all of these values are also types. There's a type called 42, and it has one possible value, the value 42. And these are called unit types, and everything sort of comes from that. And then there are different categories of types. So the string type is actually all unit types of, that are strings, and the number category is all unit types that are numbers. And, and then we have type constructors that allow you to make more complex types out of that, like true or false. That is actually exactly the same as the built-in Boolean type. It has two possible values, and it's a union of either true or false, right? And that's sort of how everything builds up, if you will. Uh, here's another type, zero or false or undefined. Uh, you know, and you can make types in, in any combination you want. This is very unlike C sharp or Java where everything is sort of single rooted and then there's a base class and whatever, that's not how this works. This, this works, this is really more like reasoning about sets of possible values. That's really what, what, what the type system is doing. And of course it gets particularly interesting here, like you can build types like string or number or undefined, right? And union types are this deep enabler that we use in control flow based type analysis because we understand now what JavaScript statement constructs, what effects they have on types. If for example, I have a variable whose type is string or number undefined, say it's x, call it x. And I say if x, open curly. Well we know that that construct removes the type undefined because that would not execute. And that means we can restrict the union type down to string and number. And that's this narrowing that control flow based type analysis does. And that's really in a sense where, where the type checker magically knows what, what, what values could your variables have and it can prove, you know, this is the deep enabler for uh, uh, non-nullable types, for example, um, and, and many other features in, in the language. Um, we also have this feature called intersection types, which are in a sense just the opposite of union types. Imagine we have two types, a colon string and b colon string. Um, when you define an object type a colon string, you're really just saying this is any object that has a property named a of type string and then some other set of properties that is unconstrained. So you're basically dealing with an infinitely large number of possible objects, but they all have a property of type a that, that is a type string, or named a, and the same for b. Um, but now we can we get intersection types, which is you know those those objects that have an A and a B. And some people have sort of commented, why is it that when I intersect um, two object types, that I end up with a union of the property names? Well, it's because you're actually constraining it more. For every property declaration you add, there are fewer possible values, right? The most possible values is curly curly. There are no constraints on any of the properties. And the more declarations you add, the more you're actually constraining the values, and the smaller the set gets. And that's why it's it's an intersection. Um, so this is sort of the mental state that if, if you want to understand the terminology of, of why the type system looks this way. Um, now, over time then, we've added a bunch of interesting uh, new type constructors like index and index access types um, were added in, in, the, in the last year or so. Um, and this is the ability now to, in the type system, reason over the names of the properties of an object. So here, for example, I have a foo type that has uh, three properties. And we have a, a, a built-in type operator called key of that allows you to say what are the possible names of properties of this type. And that'll give you a union type A or B or C. Those are the possible string names of those properties. We also have this thing we call index access type where you say, I'd like a type that is the same as the type of the A property in foo. So you can reach into things, that is an index access type. But remember again that this all operates on sets. So if you have a foo type and you index it with key of foo, well that means you're now saying, I, it's gonna be A or B or C. I don't know which one it's gonna be though. But if I index a foo with an A or B or C, what type would I get? Well, you would get a number or string or string array, right? And so you see how we're operating on sets all the time and we're trying to figure out you know, what, what are these things. And this, so you're gonna ask, why is this useful? Well, because there are lots of patterns in JavaScript where you, you pass around objects and property names and then you want to like fish out the property by that name, it's parameterized. Like for example, a get property method. This is how get and setting properties in React works, right? Um, but you need to now be able to reason about that at a higher level. So you want to be able to say, here's a get property that takes some object T and some T that is whatever the permiss per permissible property names of T are, and it returns a T sub K. But we don't know what T and K are yet. 
But once we infer it, then we would like to type check it accordingly, right? And so here, if I declare myself a variable of type foo and some key, then if I say get property of foo comma a, then we know now we can infer type number for a, um, and we can infer an error or give an error for, because we know x is not a valid property name. And we could even say, if you gave us something that is an A or a B or a C, well, then you're gonna get a number or a string or a string array. Um, so with these type operators, we can now actually start to give types to patterns that occur in JavaScript libraries, and therefore we can finally give you better statement completion. And index uh, map types are, are sort of the same idea here where you can, you can make a function that creates a record type where you pass in the names of the properties you want and, and the value that you wanna put in each property, and then we can strongly type understand what comes out of it. And you can also write crazy things like wrapping a proxy around an object um, and have us understand how this all pans out. So here is, for example, a thing that wraps a get and set proxy around every property in an object type. And now if I give you a, an item here, then I get back something that has the same properties, uh, but each property has been turned into a getter or setter of the same type, which is something that all also happens a lot in JavaScript frameworks. Now, Part of what this all turns into is sort of like us having to actually reason a lot about these higher order type equivalences. That's really what, what our job becomes, you know, and, and we understand, like, like the compiler understands all of these higher order type relationships. This is the, the part that gets hard for, for, for the compiler implementer. But behind all this crazy type theory, there's actually some really useful real world applications, and this is what powers all this excellent statement completion that, that we can provide. Um, and the latest uh, addition to the family here is uh, conditional types. Um, which allows us to express non-uniform type mappings. Uh, and I'll give you some examples here. Let's say I have um, uh, three types, name, ID, and check. And let's say that they represent labels that I wanna put in my UI. I have a certain kind of UI element that's called name that I use for strings, and IDs I use for numbers, and checks I use for, for Boolean values, right? Now let's say I want to write a function that takes some value and creates the label that corresponds to that value. Um, well, now I would have to write a whole bunch of overloads. I'm, I'm sure some of you have, have written overloads like this, where, hey, if you give me a string, then you get back a name, and if you give me a number, you get back an ID, and if you give me a Boolean, you get a check. But then, of course, you might give me something that is string or number or Boolean, in which case you get one of the others. In fact, it's not even complete here, because you might give me just string or number, in which case you should only get name or ID back and not check, because it couldn't be that, right? And so you see how this can very quickly get unwieldy to try to write a whole bunch of overloads. And really what you want is sort of the ability uh, instead to express it in the type system more directly. And that is what conditional types enable you to do. So, here we can declare a label for type. Um, so I give you a T, and then when T extends string, I want you to give me back name. And when T extends number, I want to get ID, and when T extends boolean, I want to get check. Otherwise, this should never happen, um, is what this type says. And now I can declare create label as just, it takes some T, that is a string or number of boolean, and then it gives back a label type that corresponds to that type, right? And now, it's just sort of, I don't have to write overloads, it just comes out of the types, if you will, right? That if I give you Joe, you get a name and blah, blah, blah. But if I give you, say, Joe or 42, well then that's a string or number, so you're gonna get a name or ID back, right? Because we understand how the types flow. And in fact, we will spread union types over, we will distribute union types over these conditional types. So, so that, that last, the D and E examples are interesting because the type that goes in, that we infer in, is number or string. And then we apply that to each of number and string and, and produce a resulting union type out. So if you give us a union type in, a union type comes out that has been mapped for each individual element. Um, so this cleverness you can use, we can, we can use to, to create interesting types like a, a thing that reduces a union type or extracts stuff from a union type. So for example here, if I have a string or number or some function type and I exclude a uh, function, then I get just string or number or if I extract function, then I get uh, only the function parts of it. But now I can make a non-nullable of T that gets rid of null and undefined from some t, and that's actually quite useful. Um, also, we support the ability in conditional types to infer constituent types. So say I wanna write a flatten or a smoosh of t operator. Um, and this one says, if you give me an array, then please infer the element type of the array and give me that back. Otherwise, just give me back the type that I gave you. And now, flatten of string is just a string, but flatten of number array is a number. And so, so you, can, you can actually do some interesting reaching into types. And this turns out to be very useful for creating a very wanted type operator called return type. Say I have some function type, I, wanted, I want now to, to get the return type of that function type. Well, you can create a conditional type that reaches in and, and, and gives you that. Um, it's useful, like let's say I have written some function that returns some complicated object literal. Well, return type of type of foo will give you back that type. Um, and in fact, we can, we can now build all of these into lib.d.ts, the, the predefined types. We already have uh, partial read-only and pick and record that, that some of you may have seen, but now in TypeScript 2.8, we've added exclude and extract, non-nullable, return type, instance type, and, and so forth. Okay, so that's a lot of uh, slide work. Let me, let me try to show you what this looks like in, in action. Uh, so let me switch here and try to uh, 